what I'm trying to reflect back on people is you can pick yourself and you can show up and ship work that makes things better that you are proud of and you don't need anyone's permission. We've been trained to get attached to the outcome and there's this belief that the effort, the process, the practice doesn't matter. And if the outcome isn't going to be great, don't even bother. But the only way to get to great outcomes is to show up with this practice and get better. So that's one of the key things. The second one is that we can get out of our own head by stopping this mindset of hustling people to get more than our fair share of attention and instead approach it with generosity because the purpose of shipping the work is not so you can come out ahead. The purpose of shipping the work is to make things better. But if you seek to make a change in the world, you have to ask three simple questions. Who's it for? Who specifically am I seeking to change? Who specifically am I building this for? What's it for? Can I say what this does? And what change am I seeking to make, which is related to the what's it for? If I can't say it, then I'm just ranting, right? But if I can be very clear, it's for people who believe this, it's for people who want this, it's for people who are aligned with this. And after you engage with my work, you will feel differently or you will act differently. That is the work of the creator. And we don't want to say any of those things because it puts us on the hook. And being on the hook feels uncomfortable. And so we wriggle away. But I think being on the hook is the best place to be. So I like this idea of putting your work on the hook and saying, here, I made this. And it might not be for you, but I made this. And that approach to it lets me shift my gears from, please judge me, please pay me, please reward me to, oh, I had the ability to weave something together and I did here. And most of us want to be generous and getting out of our own way is so important. You can begin with your side hustle. You can begin with your practice because it might take a while for it to get to the point where you have created something so peculiar and particular and unique and remarkable that people will eagerly pay for it. And if you need to paint your masterpiece in the next hour, I don't know how to help you. So that's the first place I start. That You may have to be a cog in the system for a little while longer as you develop trust, as you develop a reputation, as you develop the permission to talk to your followers. Trust yourself. When you're talking to yourself, who is talking and who is listening? To trust yourself does not mean that you just do whatever you feel like and are guaranteed it's going to work. It probably won't. What it means is you need to listen to that voice more often. And if you can develop a practice that lets that voice show up in a way that it can, your work, your life gets better. A lot of people want to find their passion. They say, how do I find my calling? And I point out to them that there are plumbers who think they found their calling and there are plumbers who wish they could sing opera. It turns out it has nothing to do with the profession. It has to do with our narrative about the profession. Doing the work changes our story about the work. And I think it's so much more reliable and so much easier to love what you do than it is to do what you love. Making the choice to love what you do means that whatever you're doing, you can be in love. In my experience, the best creators have learned how to see. They learn how to see because they understand genre, because they develop good taste. Good taste is knowing what your audience wants 10 minutes before they do. And domain knowledge is so important. Genre is so important. It's not generic, it's genre. What does this remind us of? What does it rhyme with? When I touch the emotion you're seeking, what other emotions are right next to it? We develop these things. Some people are really lucky early, and some people takes 10, 20 years to develop this sensibility. The first year I was a book packager, I sold my first book the first day to Warner Books. And I said, I'm gonna be a book packager. If I could sell a book a week, I'll be fine. And I got 800 rejection letters in a row. 800 times over the next 12 months, someone in the book industry cared enough to buy a stamp, send me a letter saying, this is a bad idea, go away. 800 times. 
And I didn't keep making the same mistake. I kept making new mistakes. And then something clicked into place and I learned to see. Consistency is part of being peculiar, consistently generous, consistently showing up, rhyming with yourself in a way that you're proud of, but no, not authentic. I do not believe in authenticity. I do not think you have any right to do whatever you feel like and whatever pops into your head as the version of you that you think is the authentic one is not correct. Our job as humans is not to eat, sleep and die. Our job as humans is to sing or to dance or to connect or to lead. And all of those things have tight ropes associated with them. And it's in that moment of it might not work that we, or at least me, that I become alive. Because you built something, you, it's, you organize a surprise party, you put together the pieces, and now in this moment, you're about to learn something. I have not read an Amazon review of my work in almost 10 years. Whoa. And the reason is simple, because I've never met an author who said, I read all my one-star reviews and now I'm, I'm a better writer. <laughs> Never, because what does a one star review mean? A one star review means this book wasn't for me. All right, well, you just told us about you. You didn't tell us anything about the book or me. You told us about you. Okay, thank you for telling us, but I don't need to read that in detail. To someone today, what I would say, regardless of your background, regardless of where you came from, I would say, what do you want? What do you? What, what is it that you're seeking? Because if you're trying to fill an infinite hole and the filling part isn't making you happy, I need to tell you about math. And math says infinite holes never get filled. It's not helping you get where you want to get. Instead, maybe it makes sense to say, where's your fuel? What is the work you do where when you do it, it makes you feel like you contributed something? Stop buying into metrics that were invented by other people to help them get where they want to go. Why are you doing that? What do you get in return? And how could you stop keeping track of something that shouldn't be kept track of and keep track of something else instead? That's up to all of us. Every one of us gets to make that choice. Who are you trying to please? If there's that person that you're trying to please that is always unpleasable, you found an infinite hole. Stop trying to fill it and go please somebody else. I always resist something being natural or a talent because I think it lets us off the hook way too easy. Um, I do believe that people have different emotional thermostats and they're set maybe by the way we're raised and the traumas that we have or don't have. Um, but yeah, I do also think that people are on various spectra about where they are on that thermostat thing. Uh, in my case, I think the practical discussion is what are you training in? I've been training for a really long time to answer the question, why did someone just do what they did? How do I get rid of some of the magic of the world is just a giant magic trick and I don't know how it works, right? Like, I know what Freon gas does, and I know how a refrigerator functions. It's important to me. I know that when you flip the switch on the lights, why the lights go on. That's important to me. And I needed to understand why that person who turned down my book on spots and stains turned it down, and why the person who tried to buy the book and couldn't was really angry with me. I needed to understand that the same way I need to understand why the lights work. And often, I'm completely wrong but I'm closer than if I hadn't asked the question in the first place. And so I think the training is, can we develop practical empathy? They don't know what we know. They don't want what we want. They don't need what we need. And that's okay. What do they know? What do they need? What happened to them that led them to believe that in this moment they are being reasonable? And if we can ask that question enough times, not only I think does it help us make change, it helps us, uh, live with the world as it is because we can't change the whole world but if we understand it at least we can decode it and and figure out a way to make it better